This program is brought to you by Emory University. We're going to do this. We got to do it now. You ready to swim? I'm ready. Punch it. For about the last 10 years, I've been the bioethicist for NASA. I work for the chief health and medical officer, thinking about what the bioethical issues are for space travel, for current space travel in the space station and the shuttle, particularly around medical issues. Uh, treating people in space is different than treating them on Earth, but also projecting into the future into what we at NASA call long duration space flight beyond low Earth orbit. The space station is in low Earth orbit, about 240 miles up. But of course, the moon is about 240,000 miles away. Mars is 14 million miles away. So um, it changes everything. How do we think about medicine in space? If you were equipping a craft to go to Mars, um, what do you put on it and what don't you put on it? Right now, for example, on space station, if someone were to have a serious illness or injury, the idea would be to get them back to, stabilize them, get them back to Earth as soon as possible. But as we move into these longer, longer duration space flights, we have to think about doing real-time medical care. Drugs metabolize different in zero gravity or microgravity as we call it, and uh, we have to begin to think about how do we test drugs. Um, we don't want to give a uh, astronaut patient a drug in space that we haven't tested in microgravity because we don't know how it's going to, to affect them. But how do you give an astronaut in space now a drug they don't need just to see how it metabolizes? And there are literally thousands probably drugs that we could give an astronaut in space and we can't test thousands of drugs on the handful of astronauts that are in space, the five or six astronauts, giving them a drug for multiple sclerosis and a drug for malaria and a drug I mean, so in fact, there are going to be experiments that happen in real time, clinical experiments. If you have five drugs that treat five related syndromes really well, or one drug that treats them all but not nearly as well, well, on a spacecraft you probably choose the one drug because one of the big issues in spaceflight is mass, or up mass, um, and that's NASA's term for weight, basically. For every ounce you put on the craft, you have to take something off. Um, so you can't have an enormous formulary of drugs. You can't have an x-ray machine. You can't have an MRI. Um, maybe you could have a handheld ultrasound. So all of those are decisions that have to be made very um, intentionally. What about psychiatric care? Um, you know, antidepressants and those kinds of things, sure, but straitjacket? Um, you know, hopefully these are people who have been really well tested or very healthy uh, psychologically and mentally. But does anyone really know what two and a half or three years, which is probably what a Mars mission would take, um, on a spacecraft with four or five other people is going to mean? We don't. Is it ethical to get a volunteer who agrees to go to Mars and set up a colony there with the understanding that they will never return? The tougher question, or the, the previous question to that was, is it ethical to send someone to Mars in an exploratory capacity knowing they'll never return but with the assumption that they will die early, that is we'll send them there, there's no way for them to get back, eventually their food or their oxygen will run out and they'll die. The second iteration of that question now is, is it okay to send someone to Mars having set up some kind of habitat there that will keep them alive for the rest of their life, however long that is, but they will die there and never be able to return to Earth. And the justification that lots of people give, or the historical example that they give, is early explorers who often went on explorations without a reasonable um, assumption that they'd be able to return. And if someone wants to do this, we don't, in one sense, have a right to stop them. What's interesting about this is, I don't think the government can do that. That is, the government answers to the people as a whole, and I don't think the public morality will allow or should allow um, people to in the name of the government and therefore to some degree representing me 
um, risk their life for something that's non-critical. They're a private enterprise talking now about starting colonies on Mars. If they're there, they're going to have to grow food. Uh, that means introducing biological life to Mars aside from just human beings. But there is a real ethical tension there about what right we have to begin to colonize other planets and turn them into some kind of a version of Earth. And it's only in science fiction that we've actually had that conversation in any kind of a public way, though people do talk about it in, who, are, who are particularly interested in space. But it's going to be time pretty soon for the public as a whole to weigh in on that. And it's not only about introducing life, it's also about ownership. Who owns the moon? Who owns Mars? Is it the first country that gets there? Um, do they get to claim the whole planet? Or are we going to try to make these either distributed around the world or make them public resources so that nobody really gets to own the moon or Mars. So there are all of these interesting questions in clinical ethics and research ethics, but that's only the beginning of the ethical questions in space.